Okay. All right. I uh, appreciate y'all y'all having me uh, demonstrate today. I, I love demonstrating and sharing knowledge. Today we're going to work on a variety of of Christmas tree ornaments. These are just really fun. They're simple, and, and there's several different variety uh, that you can do, and I'll go through as many of those as we have time for, and then I've got one other uh, elf ornament I want to try to get to, and then uh, during the process, I want to use some uh, sanding lubricant and introduce you all to that concept. I know it was a fairly new one to me. Uh, I didn't use it for for a number of years b before it finally got on my radar scope, and I really like it. And then using abrasive paste. I've been using abrasive paste for many years using uh, UBU Tripoli, but then I found out that it's not really, it's got VOCs in it. It, it doesn't smell good. And that uh, when Yorkshire Grit came out, uh, there was a way that you could basically make some. So I started doing that, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about using that a little bit and how you go about making it. So we're going to start. Let me change the camera view. You don't need to wait on questions. Anytime you've got a question, just, uh, just sing out. So we're going to start with a piece, uh, of, in this case, of Bradford Pear. I don't know if you all got that out there in Southern California, but this is a lovely wood. It's hard. Uh, very dense, fairly plain looking, and this is one of the few pieces I've ever run across that's actually spalted. So the spalting really makes for a really uh, pretty tree. Something this small, I could, if it's cut square, I could probably put it in my chuck square, but it's just not, not a habit I've gotten into, not one I want to get into. So I tend to want to always put a tenon on it so I can get the very best hold uh, possible and because I've got a variety of chucks I don't have to worry about I can always find a, a, a chuck generally that's got a set of jaws in it that will that will fit so we're going to start off with rounding this off at a fairly high speed I'm using a spindle roughing gouge uh, for some of y'all I, I don't know if we got any new turners out there most y'all old hands um, the spindle roughing gouge is Primary for spindle work. It's never. To, it's always for spindle works. Never to be used on cross grain. That is work perpendicular to the bedway. Uh, I know I've seen turners that say they do 90% of their work with a with a bowl gouge, but the only conclusion I can draw is they don't turn the same things that I do. So we're just going to round this off. We're going to get the speed up to maybe 2,000. I go off the wood. I don't pick it up off the wood. I, I come back on the wood before I touch the tool down. Otherwise, if you get a crack, you're liable to have uh, pull up a, a shard of wood or wood shrapnel. I sharpen the whole edge, so I want to use all of it before I go back to the grinder. Now I want to put a tenon on here. I tend to use uh, this homemade beading and parting tool, but a parting t regular parting tool will work fine. It's just with this, I can normally t do it in one pass. And that makes it really, really easy. I always like to go ahead on some pieces of wood, put the tenon on fairly early, even before I have this completely round, because on smaller pieces, if you wait till it's completely round, you may not be able to, 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 to chuck it. So we're going to knock out this. I like to use a stab center. This is a, a Robert Sorby. They're, they're very nice. They're, they're pricey, but uh, if you're in it for the long haul, they're worth the money compared to the really inexpensive uh, ap Apprentice or Wood River or Penn State uh, stab centers. So I'm using some 35 millimeter jaws that ought to, ought to hold this just fine. These are record power jaws, which I really like because they're, they're like the Nova or the Technotool jaws. They've got a little micro, micro dovetail on it, but uh, you make a parallel tenon, which I find a lot less fussy than a, on spindle work than having to do a, uh, put a, a dovetail on it. So I, I like the, these jaws. So we're going to turn this. I, normally, I bring up tailstock support 
at every opportunity, do it as long as possible, because you never can tell when something's going to cause a problem and this thing comes flying off. Normally for spindle work, I tend to wear uh, just safety glasses. But when I do bowl turning, still got a bit more to go. Just gonna shape this down to a cone. One of the advantages of when you spindle roughing gouge, if you sharpen it f uh, flat across, you can take a planing cut that you otherwise would not be able to do if you had it rounded over. So now I'm going to switch to a uh, spindle gouge. I'm using a half inch spindle gouge. And let's see this piece. We're just going to And I'm going to switch to a skew. This is a great project to kind of practice your skew skills on, at least your planing cut, which is not too terribly difficult. And it's a great skill because it gets you such a great surface on the wood. It, as a result, it minimizes your sanding, and we certainly want to avoid breathing that, that fine dust whenever we can. We're getting pretty close. I'm going to go ahead and mark the base of this, that, I think that'll probably be the tree. Maybe maybe that'll be the tree right there. And that'll be the trunk of the tree. And then this will be the, the base. I tend to like to go ahead and use a parting tool, at least mark the bottom of my turning. Pencil marks tend to go away real quick, and that way it kind of gives me that frame of reference to, to guide my eye. So this gap in the middle, I'll go ahead and do just a bit on that. This is the trunk of the tree. I don't do enough. I don't take out much because I, you know, general rule of thumb, you're going to be turning from right to left, and you want to keep as much mass over here on the left as as long as possible. So now we're in pretty good shape. I think I want to make this a little bit thinner through here, or more cone shaped rather, a little. Okay, now, so this particular one, what we're going to do, we're going to use a parting tool, and, and it's almost like making a honey dibble, and we're just going to take some parting cuts. Uh, I like to use this, uh, what they call a Nick Cook parting tool, and, and I get a kick out of this sometimes. Robert Sorby, they put their name on it like this. The instructions say you use it this way. It never made sense to me. This seemed to give more control. And when I was using it that way, one of my uh, uh, viewers commented I was using it upside down. And I thought, well, mm -hmm. and he said he had a one-page set of instructions that showed that I was doing it upside down. And let's see, I'm going to go ahead and, yeah, we're just going to do this by eye. And so I wrote Robert Sorby and explain my rationale, and they, they bounced it over to a guy that I'd actually seen demonstrate in the States. He, he was their tool representative in the United States and went on, went on a, a circuit uh, demonstrating tools. And he said he didn't use the tool much, but he'd play with it, and he played with it and said, yes, I see your point. I think you, I, agree, I tend to agree with you. But I'm sure Robert Sorby is never going to change their instructions. So I'm just coming along by eye, trying to keep these fairly even. And I'm trying to keep the center the same size down there because it's the trunk of the tree coming through. <coughs> this tends to will tend to bind just a little bit, but I don't want to open it, open it up. Maybe I can fishtail it just a little bit in, inside. But I'm not going too deep, and that the wood is, the spalted wood is is a little more relaxed than than if it wasn't spalted. 
So I'm pulling it out just as when it's almost ready to bind. So the tree looks fairly uniform. I'm 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 happy with that. Now at this point in time, I would normally take a piece of sandpaper, slow the speed down. I I tend to sand it maybe one third of the speed I turned at, and just just kind of hit it licking a promise with this 120 grit. Then I'm going to switch to 240. And I'm not going to sand all these, but this is in preparation for me to show you a little bit about that sanding lubricant. And then I'm going to I'm jumping a grit, grit or two, and I find you can get away with that on these small items. So now I'm going to 400. I've still got to finish this base down there, but that's okay. So we're going to use uh, something that I call sanding butter. And basically, it's a mixture of mineral oil and beeswax. And I'll show you. We'll talk about more about, about this, how you make this later. But I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate it. And so I'm going to get a, a piece of... Uh, kitchen paper as they say down down under uh, this is a, a trick I learned pretty handy one you get one of these uh, Danish cookie uh, butter cookie things put you a little dowel in the middle that's appropriate sized uh, wrap tape around your paper towel and cut it on on the bandsaw the finer the teeth the better but I tend to use three three teeth for ants it gets pretty aggressive and chews it up but you, you're gonna cut through the tape you, you slice a little hole with a zip wheel on a, on a Dremel, put a little tape on it uh, to keep that edge from getting too sharp, and then you can just pull out these little strips because this is just the right size for doing this kind of work. Go ahead and get that out of the way. So I'm just going to dip this a little bit in the sanding butter. And there's two ways you can do this. You can either put it on... You can put it on here. I should have done this before I went through all those sanding grits because that was whole purpose of this thing but you can see these things are kind of gnarly looking they're kind of slick but what what the uh, sandpaper does or the sanding butter is it it fills the pores with slurry and the, and the biggest advantage of it is it keeps down the fine dust that would otherwise get in your lungs because it gets down in the pores it gets in a slurry it also runs cooler which is great for exotics it Otherwise, if you're not careful, you could cause to have uh, heat checks. Uh, it can stop up the paper a little bit. You'd think that'd be a bad thing, but if you stick your finger in, in whatever lubricant you're using and rub it in, you can typically clean out some of that, that stuff. Maybe you got to wipe it off with something. Uh, if you're using a sanding disc, one of those round discs for, like, bowls, you could use, uh, you could clean it off with you know, one of these abrasive uh, uh, rubber rubber sticks, and that'll help help clean it off. But this stuff really works works great. And people always ask, but but doesn't it cause a problem with your finish? Surprisingly enough, it does not. I have not. I posted out there when I did a couple of videos. I said uh, I I challenged anybody that had a problem. Please let me know. And I have not heard from anybody. I'm just cleaning out some of it that got down in between. Haven't heard from anybody with any kind of finish. Shellac, as we know, will go over anything. And the, most of the other products have a, some type of solvent in it, mineral spirit, that will actually dissolve the wax. So the key is you're going to clean off the surface with that wax. So there's not a whole lot left on the surface. Then the next step of this process, especially on small items like, like ornaments on the lathe, because you're going to do a lot of them, you're in kind of a production mode, maybe they're too small to, to actually buff, you're going to use an abrasive paste. We'll talk about making this. It's just a variation of that sanding butter. But you get a little bit on, on a folded up paper towel. And this stuff is just got this really fine grit in it that's triple E. They call it triple E because the f there was a big deposit of triple E in triple E Libya. Don't always, they're not always red like the triple E bar on your buffing wheel. But you put it on with the lathe still and then speed it up a little bit. And 
in effect, it takes the the surface that you had and pretty much triples it. So if you, you quit at 320 or so and you use this stuff, you'll get you'll get a finish at least uh, approximating a thousand, which is much finer than most of us would ever ever sand do. And then you can turn the speed up a little bit once you get it in there good. And for something like this, that may be all the finish I'm going to put on it, a wax, a wax style finish, although it's gotten down in there, so I probably need to clean it up one more time by just sliding these in. And now we're going to change the base of this a little bit. I'm going to use my spindle gouge. Actually, I'm going to use the parting tool first. We're going to come down there. I'm using this eighth inch parting tool. Again, bringing it down to about the size of the, the tree in the middle. And now we're just going to Take the spindle gouge and just do a little gentle roll on it. Get the speed up again. Maybe nip the bottom here just a little bit. And because this is uh, spalted, it's got some black in there. I think this thing calls for... Uh, decorating with a little burn ring in here that's just just a nice little touch maybe so we're just going to put in one little ring i could use the size of a skew lay, laying down on its size to do that but i've gotten used to using this pyramid tool and i generally keep it handy so it works out just great for that cover up the sanding butter i have about three different size burn rings uh burned strings uh, a couple of them are guitar string well, one of them's a guitar string one of them's a piece of nichrome and one of them's a piece of copper so i'm just gonna put that in there i pull my hand down on the back side to give it more friction and there we go and i could go ahead and part it off i could go ahead and finish the point but we're i think you all see the point on that i'm going to set this aside and move on to the next one. Okay, the next one has got a series of scallops to it, um, which gives it a different look. When you make these things, uh, they can be Christmas ornaments, or they could be Christmas decorations. And the distinction, if it's a if it's Christmas tree ornament, they they need to be fairly lightweight. But you could make uh, a set of these in different sizes, and they make a very nice table uh, table grouping. I don't know what I did with my spring punch. I tend to, I like to use a, uh, here it is. I spared no expense. This is a Harbor Freight punch. Sometimes you got to buy two of them to, to get one that works, but they're always good about taking them back. But And I turned a little mushroom wooden handle on it, but... It, I tend to just eye these things. You can use a center finder, but the more you do this, the, the more you practice, you train your eye. You think of imaginary line coming from corner to corner, and then you just bring this across till you hit that imaginary line. And once you train your eye, you'll get pretty good at it, and it's going to be round by the time you finish in any case. So we're going to go back to that uh, Steb Center. This is a piece of red oak uh, that's got some color in it. What is really nice is if you get access to some spalted red oak, you can really get some spectacular uh, coloration in it, which really looks nice. And you can add features to the top uh, toppers. You can have a cross, you can have a circle, you can have a point, you can have an angel, you can even a, do a star on top lock that down turn this make sure it clears 
Get the speed up a little bit. Anchor the, anchor the tool, ride the bevel, lift the handle till it cuts. Move in the direction of the flute. on its side take just a little bit of a cut there and I'm gonna put a I'm gonna take a little bit more off before we put it in, put a chuck tenon on it And let me do a quick measure. I've got kind of a, a go no go ga gouge that I can use, and that'll just make it for my normal jaws. Take that back. So I'm using a Supernova 2. I have a couple of Supernova 2s and I got a record power. It looks virtually identical. I know I get comments saying, well, they're made in the same factory. They're like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> they are different enough. One of them looks like a knockoff of the other, but they're not made in the same factory because there's too many differences. So I put that in, hold it flat, turn it tight, turn it around. Do it again, turn it one more time, just to have it snug. This is one I think I could probably dispense with using, but I'm not going to, because I still bring up the tail stock. You never can tell when the wood's gonna have a flaw in it. Something completely unexpected from what's inside, and going 2,000 RPM, you don't want it to hit you in the face, if you can avoid it. All right, so I'm using a spindle roughing gouge to get this thing down to a cone just because it's a little bit faster because it is a fairly aggressive tool for getting things round. That's the advantage of it. And now I think I'm going to put a ball on the end of it, so I'm going to just mark this right about there. Take it down a little bit. Now that I've got it marked, I can come down and finish shaping the tree down into that feature. But these do make very nice uh, gifts because they don't take a lot of time and you can do different things with them such as making a table grouping this is too large for a Christmas tree ornament but it's with a different it can look very nice on a on a table during the and I'm going to taper this just a little bit more it's a little fat Now we want to decide how far down the bottom of this is. It's still not quite round here, so I need to take it down a little bit more. Put my all away so I can find it. Okay, I think this is going to be the base of the tree. That's going to be the trunk. And that will be the base. Uh, if it's a table grouping, sometimes you want the base to be a little bit bigger. If it's going to be a, a Christmas tree ornament, you can afford to make that base a little smaller to reduce the weight just a little bit, which is 
always a good idea on a Christmas tree ornament. So we're just going to mark this, mark this. Now, due to that scalloping, I'm going to go ahead and hit this uh, a lick with the uh, sanding because of the scallops, it's going to be hard to get any ridges that might stick up. So I'll just kind of hit it a lick. And that's really all it takes. Now, there's a couple of ways you can go about this. Uh, the best way, I think, is, is to use a spindle gouge. This one's got a fairly steep grind on it, maybe... It's probably closer to 50 than it is 40, which 40 is pretty much what I'd use on most spindle gouges. So we're going to start at the bottom, and we're just going to make a series of scallops. Now, if you don't feel confident with using a tool like this on making it, you could always use a cove tool, which is just shop-made tool. It's got a round bar of about a quarter inch or six or seven millimeter high-speed steel cut at a very... Uh, at least a 45 degree angle, maybe a little steeper and ground flat. And I'll show you that this, this does a pretty good job. Get in there a little bit tighter with a smaller tool rest. So I can reduce, increase the leverage. So because of this angle, I can keep the handle almost flat, but I don't have to raise the handle to get ang that raise the handle to get to that negative rake. I actually, raise this up a little bit where you'd normally have to do that on a scraper. But because of this angle, I can keep it flat and it's still in a negative rake position. That is, the cutting edge is pointing downhill. So that's one way to do it, and I get a, and it's not bad. I just find it more fun to to do it, cut the scallops, a series of coves, if you will. With a cove, you're going to cut them, come in with the angle, uh, cutting angle, the bevel, straight, perpendicular. So it's about 45 degrees across your body. Then you're going to come in from the left-hand side. Then you're going to come in from the other side and do the same thing with it at an angle. So we're just going to take a series of back and forth cove cuts. And actually, with this, sometimes I don't, I'd skip coming back on the other side a little bit. That's ideal, but sometimes with some wood, I get a pretty good surface without it. Generally, though, it's best to... Whoa! That's called a catch. Drop the handle as you enter that cut. Drop the handle, lean into it, now for these I'm using, I've been using a half, half an inch spindle gouge, but actually I probably ought to switch to a 3 8 inch because they ought to get a little smaller as we approach the end, so I'm going to Actually, I was using a 3 8 inch. I was just using a different one. I forgot. Now we're going to go ahead and move the tailstock live center out of the way. Maneuver this a little bit closer. That's a pretty big sphere at the end of this thing, so I want to take it down a little bit. I 
actually for this one, I think a point might look better. So I'm going to go ahead and just turn a point. So it's kind of a funny looking gap right there. So I think I'm going to come back in on this side. And bring this over just a little bit. And there we go. Now I'm going to come back to the base and deepen that a little bit right here where the trunk's going to be. Uh-oh. That wasn't pretty. Let's see how do we recover from that. All right. So I think the easiest way to recover from that is probably make the trunk a little bit longer there. So I'm going to come in here. I probably should have avoided using this piece of red oak. I, it's plagued me. A friend of mine gave me a big plank that was cut from Alaskan sawmill and air dried. And I don't know whether there's ring shakes, but there just seemed to be an awful lot of problems with uh, the... I had two small uh, men's change bowls that both of them came apart during turning, so shame on me for using a clunky piece of wood like this, but I thought it'd be pretty. So basically, there's that, that Christmas tree. We're not going to bother to sand it or, or clean it up or part it off. We're just going to set it aside, and I'll come back and finish these later. A another style you can do if you got access to some branches is you take your little branch like this and you can do a natural edge at the very bottom and a natural edge to the base and still do that uh, you know whatever style you you want but I think it lends to to the style we're going to make next actually. This time, I think I will just put it in a in the chuck. Let me find my. Yep. Kind of eyeball centering this thing. Probably not the best way to do it. Tighten that down. Come in. Tighten this up. You just don't get as good a hold with a square piece of wood. Especially if your wood is not, not milled perfectly square. I cut most of my stock on a bandsaw, so. Generally, it's going to be off a little bit, but that's okay. All right, go back to the spindle roughing gouge. Let me drop this down just a little bit. Back to anchor the tool, ride the bevel, lift the handle till it cuts. switch to a skew here and just take a little bit of a planing cut here. Let me switch to a little different view so you can kind of see what, what my positioning looks like in terms of how I'm moving my body. Let me go back and adjust the camera out a little bit. If sometimes we, we focus all our attention on the edge of the cutting stool, a tool, but sometimes it's important to see actually how the, the turner is actually moving their body doing the turner's dance.
So in this case, I can hold this tucked in tight to my, whoop. Turner's dance. Now we're back on top. Okay. So, and then we'll do something down here with a bass again. That. We'll just go ahead and. So now we're going to use a skew to make a series of V cuts. A lot of people are worried. You know, they they tried to use a skew without any instruction. They got a skate back and it, they panicked and put it back in their toolbox, never to be used again. But a, a V is not a difficult cut with a skew. And there's no other tool that can cut a V like a skew. Now, the closest thing you can come to it is with a detail gouge like this. I think it's about 20% uh, deep. So as a result, you've got a lot of steel here, and you can really bring this back and make it a very steep grind, 30 degrees. And, and as a result, you can get in close, but it's still not going to be uh, the same detail that you can get with a, with a skew on a V-cut. We're just alternating cuts, just following that, that bevel on down into it. And now we're going to just cut a series of scallop, uh, or maybe scallops not the right right term. Probably an asymmetrical cove. And this is a chance for me to do some skew practice, keep my skills up. Because at the end of the day, and I was doing a bunch of these, I'd probably resort to a spindle gouge. And this piece of wood is nothing more than a two by four construction pine, which up until COVID didn't cost a lot of money. Of course, now anybody that's building a house or doing any house renovations, they see the price of lumber going up dramatically with all the building that's taking place and the supply chain disruptions that we're getting. So that makes kind of a nice shape. I want to kind of crisp, just chamfer that little edge right there. And now this one is going to be lightweight, so I would I would plan on making this one a Christmas tree ornament. So I want to show you a couple of ways of how you prepare this thing for a Christmas tree ornament. I'm just going to make this one a point. I've got to come down and get rid of a little bit of that damage from the from the live center by rolling this over. Now, there's a couple of ways you could do this. Uh, a lot of people like to use screw eyes. Uh, let me find. And if you like screw eyes, your best supply, I have a link on it on, on uh, two or three of my Christmas tree videos, but it's Peachtree Woodworking here in Atlanta. You can get a hundred of these in either gold or silver for a couple of bucks. I mean, and these are really nice, fine little screw eyes, or they call it, if you do a search for screw eyes, you won't find it. So if you get to Peachtree Woodworking, they call it, uh, I think, a, a screw eyelet or an eyelet sc screw or something. Something strange that hard to hard to find. Let me, so let me find my storyboard here of 
Okay, here's, here's an example of screw eyes. These are the kind you're going to get in a hardware store, and they are just big and clunky. You can order them from somewhere else, maybe on Amazon, and you might get one like this. This is the size I'm using. It's a very nice size in that it's, it's fairly small. Now, options are you can use some craft wire you can get from Michaels or Hobby Lobby like this. I think this is 20-gauge, very, very soft. And you can make them, but they're more trouble than, it's, than they're worth when you can buy them for uh, two cents a piece for peach tree and buy some other stuff to help absorb the shipping. Another possibility is uh, an earring finding. You can get these uh, at Michaels and Hobby Lobby. But then you got to figure out how to get it mounted, and CA glue will probably hold it, but I don't much care for these, although they're very they're very small. They're not real expensive. They probably, I'm kind of guessing, but they, they probably cost four or five times as much as a screw eye. But they're all, they're all different ways of, of doing it. The other alternative that I like to use whenever possible is to actually drill a hole and dispense with the screw eye by uh, having the ribbon go right through the piece. Now, I like to do it on a join, like, like here, but I could do it here. It, and you want to think about where the grain is and how it would hang on the tree, maybe with that loop of that cord. I'm going to put it right here. I'm going to use this birdcage awl. These are, these are great fun projects to make. Uh, it's made out of piano wire. The, it's called a birdcage awl because it's got four sides to it, and they're all sharp. And with a micro uh, point on it, it's, high, it's not high-speed steel, it's, uh, but it's almost tool steel strength. But it, it will drill a hole because of those four sharp, sharp uh, sides, birdcage awl. Uh, great, great club project to have a workshop and make awls because you can you got to buy seven pieces three feet long so you get a lifetime supply. So anyway, got, we got it marked. We're going to take a 16th inch drill bit. And when you go to buy these drill bits, usually for, for 16th inch, you're going to have to get one with a shank like this because a lot of times a lot of these electric drills won't clamp down on anything that small otherwise. So we're just going to get it in here drill through. Uh, we're ob always going to get a little bit of blowout on the other side, so we're just going to, you know, touch that up with a little bit of shaping paper. Now, when you let's talk about ribbons just a little bit. There's a couple ways to go about this. One way is if you're a fisherman and you got lots of monofilament line, Monofilament line can make you a, a seamless uh, hanger on this. What I like to do is I get this. Do you all have Hobby Lobby out there in California? The store chain, crafts chain? Hobby Lobby is the only place I've found that has this thread. You can't get it at Michael's. They used to sell it uh, a gold, a silver, and a red uh, it was a it was a great bargain. And then they discontinued it. I put it in a in a stiff see through plastic bag, nip off the corner, and that way I can just kind of pull it out. And this makes a really great uh, little ribbon. It's sixteenth of an inch ribbon. Let me get some scissors here, and it will just seem to it, somehow it shouldn't, but a sixteenth inch ribbon will go through a sixteenth inch hole. usually but a 1 8 inch beaded chain if you're making fan pulls will not go through a 1 8 inch hole so you got to use drill 9 16 but anyhow you do that you just tie off the end of it and that that's your hanger and that's just a really nice way and it adds a nice little bit of pizzazz i think uh that dresses them up whereas if you just put a uh, just a screw eye on it give it to somebody i i it it seems to, to lack something. So even if I use a screw eye, I'll use this one eighth, uh, this uh, sixteenth of an inch ribbon, and it comes in silver, and in gold. Another option that I saw recently, which 
you, you know, if, if your spouse uh, has this in, in their, their sewing kit, you can use it. It's called uh, yarning thread, I think. It's, it's fairly thick thread. The problem uh, uh, that I found with it is it, it wants, the end wants to come loose. So you almost have to use a piece of uh, uh, soft beeswax like this and pull it along the thread to wax it a little bit to have any control over it. And it's a lot thinner than the 116. But this is another option. And if it's on hand and you got some wax, it works great. If you don't have wax, it's kind of a pain to deal with. Uh, it's try hard to get this end twisted and flat. It just wants to keep fraying out to get it into a hole. All right, let's see. So those are the main thing on Christmas tree ornaments uh, for the Christmas trees. We got any questions before I leave this one and go to a different style? Nope. All right, so the next one we're going to make is one of my favorites I, uh, that I found out about last year, and it's, it's an elf. Um... Let me find a couple. And these are just, just as cute as they can be. And I found through, I've had two or three small sales, and I don't normally sell my work, but but I had a couple of craft sales at, at, at church in my neighborhood where I didn't have to go far, and it wasn't all day long, didn't have to do any setup. Uh, but I found these things to be really big, big sellers. They're very e super easy to make. Uh, you just got to buy some of this faux fur. That's what they call it, faux fur. And you can get that from probably most any shop that sells material, I'm guessing. But uh, I've had real good good luck with Hobby Lobby because they've got lots of choices. Some of them kind of funky colored. Uh, this is brown. Uh, you can get it in uh, in in white. Uh, so those are all fun fun choices. Now, if you're going to make a bunch of these, I'm a big believer in making making a storyboard when you know you're going to do something over and over and over, especially of a seasonal nature. I'm fumbling around looking for my storyboard, so bear with me. And, and here's one with a, with a white fur. Uh, it, they lend themselves to, if you have dye, Dyeing the uh, the hats, uh, you can do funky uh, shapes to them, uh, all kinds of fun fun things. And so, making a little storyboard helps a little bit for projects like this on a seasonal nature, or if you're making a chess set, so you can make sure they all look alike. I don't care if these all look alike, but I, it's nice to have something that that reminds me of exactly how big the blank needs to be. So I tend to make my storyboard enable me to go take the storyboard and look around in scraps of wood to say, is this one big enough? Is it is it fairly square? Is it the right length? Or is it too long or too short, too long? Cut it off. And there's where the storyboard comes in, in great. So we're going to mark centers on this. You want a fairly lightweight piece of wood. Uh, box elder is great. Poplar is great. Uh, I guess you could use pine, but I want a two-inch piece, two-inch square, and that's hard to get pine two-inch square. Two-by-fours are going to wind up being an inch and a half. This was a cutoff of some kind of plank. That's what the green is. Marking the, the species of wood or keep it from cracking, I guess. I don't know where I got this thing from. But it's lightweight. Poplar is a good wood because you frequently, you around here anyway, you can get it at a lumber yard uh, in kiln-dried lumber. We also have a lot of poplar trees, so that's another another possibility. Box elder is is a great choice because it's very lightweight as well. But any lightweight wood, try to avoid the heavy ones, otherwise, because this is not a hollowed or ornament. So if it's 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 going to be pretty good size. Round it off.
I always evaluate a piece of wood to say which end is going to go in the chuck and why. In this case, because this is painted green, there's a chance that there might be some minor checking in here since this is the end of the piece. So that's the part that's going to go in the chuck uh, because the, chuck, the, the checking is not going to cause a problem on the actual turning itself. So now we got this ready to go in a chuck. And if you're gonna, if you're into production turning, you're gonna do a bunch of them, then you probably want to round all of them at one time, and then start chucking them. Save you a little bit of time instead of on and off, on and off. this in here, tighten this up, turn it around, tighten it again, I think that'll hold it. All right, so now I'm going to get my storyboard, and there's nothing magic about this. Well, needs to be a little bit more rounded, but we'll worry about that later. So there's going to be a little ball, there's the top of the hat. And there's the, the bottom of the ornament. Mark that one. Mark that one. Mark that one. So now we start bringing this down. So I'm going to take a peeling cut to bring the end down to where the ball is going to be. Because I've got a little bit of damage there, probably I could either take this off and drill a hole in it like I did, or I could use a screw eye. In this case, <coughs> I think we're going to use a screw eye. Just going to mark the bottom here. Now, the depth is deep enough that it'll kind of cover the fur, so you still got a little bit of this sticking out beyond the fur, uh, about a quarter of an inch. So I'm going to come down about a quarter of an inch. So I'm going to use my eighth inch parting tool to kind of mark it. Mark the bottom. And now it's very similar to making a, uh, the same operation as if you were making a, a birdhouse ornament roof. I switch to a half inch because it hogs out a little more wood than the 3 eighths. But I do, my 3 eighths inch spindle gouge is my workhorse. That's what I do most of my spindle turning with. Now we're going to come in here just like before with it across my body at 40, about 45 degrees so the bevel is perpendicular to make that entry cut. So we don't, we know it's going to kick back every time. So I always have a tendency to brace it with my finger. It's just a habit I've gotten into in case I get sloppy with the entry cut. And then once you get it started, and that's about as much wood as I can hog at one time, probably too much. Spindle gouge will not hog as much wood as a bowl gouge. Now, Rebecca DeGroot uh, did a video on this same ornament, as did uh, Nick Zametti. Rebecca's was a little more refined in that she put a contrasting piece of wood in a ball here. Frankly, I found, to me, that's a little fussy for these. Um, it's just easier to crank them out, and if you wanted a darker color, I use a die pin. 
because I want these to be fairly inexpensive, easy to make for me to give away or sell. Come back a little bit further on that rim, that hat rim. Ride the bevel. Slow down as the diameter gets smaller. I need to slow down my feed rate. And I think we about got it. Now I'm going to roll over the bottom just a little bit. And I probably should roll over the top a little bit so it doesn't look like a birdhouse. And now we're just going to shape the, the body a little bit. We want to take this down and roll it over just a little bit from the middle. It's about a five millimeter difference in diameter from the center. The center is about 81, I'm sorry, 41 millimeter. And the part right under the hat and at the base is around 30, 35 millimeter. But again, that's just the way I do it. Nothing magic about it. And I don't bother to even much measure them anymore. You want a slow roll. I did a little bit too much of a roll. And I came down a little aggressive with that uh, parting tool, so I need to join this to get rid of that little seam there. It'll show up on the back otherwise. Okay, now you got to figure out where's the nose going to be. So I look at the grain. You're not going to see any grain down here to speak of because that's where the fur is going to be, but you're going to see it on the hat. So if you've got a nice pattern there, I would put that toward the, toward the front. Then I've got to mark where I'm going to drill that hole and a little trick that I've gotten to use. I learned this from a old woodworker. I made a, I made a series of uh, um, feeler gauges out of wood. They range from an eighth of an inch, three sixteenth, a quarter, three eighths, one and a quarter, three quarter, 13 16 7 16 a half. So I'm going to get down to the one that's 3 16 because what I've discovered, uh, I like the nose to be about 3 3 eighths of an inch. It, it's going to be a big nose. So to mark it, you need to make sure that you've got the, the mark at least a bit more than half the distance. Let me line that grain up again. Just more than half the distance of 3 16 so that nose will clear it underneath. So 3 16 is half of 3 eighths, and the nose is 3 eighths inch. Then I give it just a, just a skosh more room. And if I mismeasured, I'd use a smaller nose. So I'm going to use my spring punch. Again, get this lined up right there. Whoop. And that's where I'm going to drill. And I'm going to drill. You, you can pick your size that you want for the tenon on that nose. I like about uh, 3 16 I like a Brad Point, uh, Brad Point uh, drill bit, but I don't have, didn't have one handy, so I'm going to do this. It may wallow around a little bit. This thing's kind of dull. I want to drill a little bit more. don't want to drill all the way through, but in case the tenon on my nose is a little long, I don't like for it to bottom out. And now we go, uh, go ahead and start uh, sanding it sanding it off. Uh, again, I generally like to drill a hole for the cord, but in this case, uh, I want to show you how I would deal with it with the screw eye. And I would use this, this vice hand drill. It works great. And since we've already got a little starter hole there, slow the speed down, maybe no more than about 1,200 or so. Rest your hand on here on the, 
on your tool rest, kind of steady it, and just ease it in. And I found these little drill bits at a wood show, and I've, I've got like 10 of them in a package, and they've lasted forever. They're very tiny. There's probably a numbered size. I don't know what they are. They're smaller than a sixteenth of an inch, but they're a perfect fit for that uh, those tiny little little screw eyes. And if you don't drill a hole, trust me, you will snap the screw eye every time. And you just put it on. Uh, but I'm going to finish sand and finish this before I put the screw eye on. So I'll just set that aside. Uh, so there's that process. Again, when you get into production turning, you tend to go a little bit faster if you're doing several of these at one time, and that includes turning the noses. So let me show you that process. I'm going to just take this aside. The chuck I like to use for small round things like that nose is I like to use a collet chuck. And... This is a great accessory if you do a lot of small stuff. You, I've got a set of uh, collets on the wall. Let me just show you. They come with about five different collets, but for about less than $40, you can get a, an extra set. So you can get all these. You got these collets about a sixteenth of an inch part going from very, very tiny up to just a hair larger than three quarters of an inch. And as a result, um, if you don't get your tenon on your, your dowel sized exactly right, it doesn't matter. You can find a, a collet that, that will pretty much fit it. So I'm looking for one. So we're going to come over here. They, there's there, Beal, John Beal, who does the Beal uh, buff system, ha makes a very nice one. But I'm real happy with the one I got from Craft Supply, and it's a... Uh, one and a quarter inch thread for a big lathe, but it also comes with a an insert, which I don't have to have handy. It's across the room, but it threads in here. doesn't stick out very far to fit it to a, a one inch. So even if you have a mini lathe and you think about it, you might upgrade lathes in the future, I would get the uh, one from Craft Supply because they're about the same price. They look like they're made in the same factory. It's just like Penn State doesn't sell anything bigger than one inch on, on most of their the accessories. But this is just a great little thing for finials and perches and noses. So you can put this thing all the way back into your tail, uh, your headstock, and then you just turn one, pull it out, do another one, turn one, pull it out. And this is used, uses what they call Tommy bars. The way it's knurled, I can normally just uh, use it without even using the, the Tommy bars. I'll pull that out just a little bit more. And normally it will hold it. The beel you, you, it is smooth and you have to use a wrench. So that's another reason I like this particular one. So I'm going to grab one that I've already got turned to show you what it looks like. So these noses look pretty big. I can say about 3 8 inch. This might be a little size over. Ten and long enough to go in your hole. So you're going to... I like to go ahead and do it ten and first because that way I can check to make sure that the tenon is sized properly because it's easy enough for me to turn a, a knob on the end of it toward the headstock. So... We're going to use uh, this, bring it on down, and then I like to use for a, a, a measuring gauge, you can use calipers, but I find I have really good luck just using a... Uh, a drill bit uh, template. So I'm going to make this thing 3 16ths of an inch, probably. Where's the 3 16ths? Three, there it is, right there. Almost there. And that's an easy way to, to size it. Of course, the other way to size it 
is just grab the uh, the piece we just finished uh, turning where we drilled a hole. But I think I used a different size drill drill bit. So it's just about right. So I'm gonna call that good. And we're just gonna bring this down here just a little bit. And then I like to just chamfer the end with just a little tiny little cut like that to make sure it'll easy to slip it into a hole. Yep, that's just about perfect. The more you do this, the luckier you get. So uh, this is a beading parting tool. This is another good, great uh, club project, get together for a workshop. You can get these bars. They're parting uh, tools for the metal industry. They're 8 millimeter by 8 millimeter by 200 high-speed steel, probably made in China or India. But they're good enough for metal work, so they're good enough for woodwork. It's a very inexpensive uh, beading and parting tool when you make them in a workshop because you buy them in groups of about four if you I've got a video on making one you can find a link to it sometimes finding the steel can be tricky now I probably ought to measure this to make sure it's not too big and actually just Take it down to three-eighths of an inch. Got a little bit more to go. So we'll go ahead and that's when we go ahead and sand this off. And this is again another good a good uh, time to uh, use that sanding a uh, liquid liquid uh, lubricant, and it's kind of hard to sand the front of this thing. But guess what? I can put this thing in, a, in another collar chuck. So if I did a whole bunch of these at one time, I could go ahead and stick them in a collar chuck one right after another, sand off the end, put a coat of finish on it, friction polish or what have you, abrasive paste to, to get it nice and smooth. Can't quite get down in there with that, so let's switch to a skew. There we go. So let's see how that how that fits. Now this is a little bit snug. So here's the trick when you get snug. Here's another accessory. I keep trying to spend people's money, but if you do a lot of this stuff, sometimes these accessories really pay off. And this is a plumber's reamer, and it will. You can stick it in that hole and just do that a few times and this works great for birdhouse ornaments with perches fruit when you're putting in stalks uh, noses all kinds of things uh, coffee uh, coffee scoops and you can get get a perfect perfect fit now to when you go to cutting these the, the fur you're just going to cut it from the back side with a with a crack knife or uh, uh, an exacto knife cutting very carefully through the fabric so you don't trim off the the fur I like to draw a line down the middle that kind of gives me a, a feel for cutting that little V at the bottom it also makes it a little easier when I go to lining it up now the trick to where the nose goes is you're gonna fold this thing over and you're gonna take a very sharp pair of scissors, which is not my shop scissors. So let me see if I got a sharper pair over here in a drawer, which I think I do. This is by far the easiest way to cut a little hole for that. 
you just cut a tiny little notch like this. Now, glue, I've learned this the hard way. <laughs> There's some glues that do a whole lot better for this project than other glues. And the glue that I found the very best, CA glue will have a tendency, no matter what you do, what thickness, whether you use the uh, accelerator, it's going to go through this fabric, go right through this fur, get all on your hands, mat the fur up, and you're going to have a mess on your hands. I've tried hot melt glue um, with some better results, but it, it's kind of a pain, too, because it's hot. you got to move quickly. What I found the very best glue for this project, and I use this for a lot of glue projects with wood, is recommended to me by somebody who's a scroll saw. It's called Aileen's Original Tacky Glue, and I think you can get this from Hobby Lobby and, and Michaels. The best way I can describe it is it, it feels like carpenter's glue, but it's thicker and tackier. So you can put this on there uh, fairly easily and and use the nose you know I, I poke a hole through the back side with the nose first kind of get that hole going then i stick it stick it through like that then i stick it in that kind of holds it in place then i can use eileen's tacky glue to come behind it and put a little seam around it and hold it down for just a couple of moments and uh, sometimes I've been known to put a rubber band around it to hold it in, in place, but that's how you decorate it. Now, you got this fur going every which way. You can use any r normal hair products to shape the fur. If you want to twist and make a handlebar mustache or, or what have you, and if you want to make it nice and smooth, get you, get you your spouse's old toothbrush and just come along here and just, uh, you know, comb it out. That way you can make it look nice and nice and smooth. Any questions on these elves or Nordic Nissies? They're Nordic Nissies because that's part of the folklore in Scandinavia where they're elves that guard the uh, farmstead if you treat them right. That's, that's... Uh, on hair color? Yeah, uh, almost anything. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about uh, this sanding abrasive. I talked about some of the uh, lubricant first. Sanding lubricant could be as simple as water. It could be walnut oil. Uh, I just find this stuff to work very well, and it's very easy to make. I've got a short video. I'm going to play. Need mineral oil. Obviously, you need some type of containers to put your concoction in. And lastly, of course, you need a you need a set of uh, you need a set of postal scales or or food scales. And then lastly, you need some type of safe way to melt these ingredients together. Let's start with beeswax. If you know a beekeeper, you can uh, likely get beeswax from them. Uh, you might want to consider taking a uh, small wood turning uh, gift with you if they're a friend. You can also buy a craft store, uh, buy beeswax from a craft store like Hobby Lobby or Michaels. I have a link to my Amazon shop in the video description below where you can also get a pound of either beeswax pellets or a bar, and they're about the same price. Beeswax pellets are easy to melt and they save you the trouble of cutting into small chunks. Now the other ingredient, uh, mineral oil, I believe they call this liquid paraffin overseas, is basically a uh, derivation of, of petroleum. In the simplest of terms, it could be described as a highly refined uh, edible lubricating oil. As such, it does not dry when it's applied to wood. Why mineral oil? Well, mineral oil is soluble in all petroleum-based thinners and turpentine, and any finish that uses these same solvents can be put over it. Lacquer, shellac, varnish, drying oils will absorb uh, any mineral oil that's already in the wood in the new finish, and there'll be no, there should be no adhesion problems. But it doesn't come, it, it comes, it doesn't come with, with a guarantee. 
another reason for mineral oil is it's relatively inexpensive and lastly it's green that is there's no volatile organic compounds like mineral spirits here's the steps we're going to go through first if you buy your beeswax in, in pellets you can save this effort but you're going to cut the wax into small chunks or use a cheese grater if you're not using pellets you can get a simple cheese grater at the dollar store but cutting it with a knife also works you're going to weigh out your ingredients a typical recipe in the one I use calls for one part beeswax melted into four parts mineral oil by weight notice I say by weight a reasonable container size is eight ounces now mineral oil has a lower specific gravity uh, than beeswax that is it's less dense so it actually takes about 1.188 liquid ounces of mineral oil to equal one ounce of mineral oil by weight so let's do some math the final mixture let's say the final mixture is going to be eight ounces well 20 percent of the mixture is beeswax by weight using our one to four ratio so eight ounces of the final solution times 20 percent yields 1.6 ounces of beeswax we're going to need. The concoction also needs 80% mineral oil by weight using our 1 to 4 ratio. 8 ounces times 80% is equal to 6.4 ounces mineral oil by weight. Okay, we're going to weigh out the ingredients by weight. I generally put the uh, beeswax on a piece of wax, wax paper and, and disregard the weight of the wax paper as being insignificant. I'm using some postal scales, but perhaps you have some food scales. Uh, the digital scales work very nicely, and after they uh, come on, the first thing you got to do, if you're going to use a container, for example, to mix your mineral oil, you're going to change, you're going to set what's called a tear on it, or a tear weight, by pushing the button, and that basically uh, eliminates the weight of this in your measurement. Now you can pour in your 6.4 ounces of, of mineral oil, and uh, and it won't be weighing weighing the cup. Now, six multiply the required 6.4 ounces of mineral oil by weight times the specific gravity of mineral oil, uh, or 1.188. Uh, actually, that's probably not the specific gravity. It's the amount it takes to to equal one ounce by weight. This will give you 7.6 liquid ounces equal 6.4 ounces by weight. Use this approach to scale up your ingredients for a larger batch. Now you're going to mix all your ingredients together uh, and, uh, and, and heat it up in, until, until it melts while continuing to stir it. You can use a double boiler, that is, a container in really a large pot with water on the bottom and sides. Fits into the rim of, of the bottom of the pan. In use, the top pan is heated by steam from the boiling water in the bottom pan. A water bath helps, keep, uh, helps heat up things evenly. You don't want the container containing the wax to actually sit on the bottom of the larger container without water under it or it might get too hot. I prefer to use a slow cooker, also known as a crock pot. It works well and it's safer than heating over an open flame. I picked up a quart size at the thrift store for less than $4. A crock pot works well in your shop and it gets the whole process out of the kitchen. This can be a good thing unless your partner doesn't mind and is willing to help. To the uh, mineral oil. This crock pot I don't think gets much hotter than 212 so it's a very safe way to uh, to melt this. There's no open flame. Uh, easy to, to do it in your shop without the need of a hot plate or propane or a camp stove or anything. Uh, you can probably pick these up at a, a thrift store for little or nothing. This concoction of beeswax and mineral oil makes a great sanding paste and, we, and mix it up. Go ahead and take the heat off and you're going to keep stirring it, unlike weight, the finer grits. Uh, to the point that I'm probably not going to experiment with it by playing with different uh, abrasive uh, compounds. There's lots of different abrasives you can use. We're going to use diametaceous earth, which is basically a mechanical uh, insecticide that you can pick up your big box store. You can get it at at Lowe's or, or Home Depot, uh, it's basically triple E. It's the same stuff uh, that you would, you would get in your uh, uh, buffing your triple E buffing compound. It's a naturally occurring soft sedimentary uh, rock made from fossilized algae uh, from millions of years ago. 
it's 70 to 80% silica, and it's a very, very fine abrasive. And strangely enough, it's food safe. You could eat it. You don't want to breathe it. You don't want to get it in your eyes. Uh, diamantaceous earth, or DE, is also used in uh, pool uh, filtration units. So if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or some other store, you're going to look for it in the, sec in the insecticide aisle, and you can get uh, about nine, uh, I think it's, uh, well, let me get the bag and I'll show you. So here's what that bag looks like. Um, it is a very, very fine, you can blow it, it's almost like a talcum uh, powder. Uh, four pounds of it costs you about nine bucks, so it should give you a lifetime supply of abrasive uh, paste, unless you do use it around your shop for cockroaches, ants, fleas, silver, fish, earwigs, ear wigs, and, and bed bugs. <laughs> Now, I've, personally, I found that this uh, uh, mixture of mineral oil, beeswax, and diatomaceous earth uh, does very well. Now, that's not to say there aren't other abrasives, uh, and I'm not going to experiment with them, but there's, there's rotten stone, there's aluminum oxide, there's uh, uh, ceramic, uh, there, there, there's pumice, they come in various grits, uh, and you can play with those if, if you sanding. like this sanding paste. Uh, can actually save time on uh, on your sanding because you're not going to uh, use as much sandpaper. You're not necessarily going to go up to finer grits. And I find it as an alternative to the buffing uh, the buffing system. I think you can get very similar similar results. It's like taking your last grit and and tripling it. So here's the formula that I've I've, uh, I've I'm using. One part beeswax to one part Tripoli, that is diatomaceous earth, and five parts of mineral oil by weight. And as we described last week in that video, uh, an, an ounce of mineral oil doesn't weigh an ounce. So it, 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 this is by weight. One of the advantages of, of this product, besides cost, you can make a seven ounce container of this for about about two bucks. But one of the other advantages it has over some of the commercial uh, uh, products uh, is is smell. This has got a very pleasant uh, beeswax type of smell to it. Uh, some of the commercial products uh, have uh, solvents in them, vol volatile organic compounds that uh, cre create a pretty harsh harsh smell that a lot of people don't don't care for. Uh, let's, let's start with a 7 ounce uh, uh, mixture. We're going to take 1 ounce by weight of beeswax. You're going to cut it up or grate it, weigh it out, put it in your, uh, your cooker. We're not going to go into the details of cooking because that'll, that'll be, that was in last week's video. Uh, we're going to use a, a crock pot. Go ahead and mix in your uh, 5 parts of mineral oil. Uh, and if you don't want to bother to weigh that out, you can actually uh, measure it in ounces, and you're going to use uh, six ounces instead of five. But if you weigh it, it's five ounces. Uh, heat it until it's thoroughly, uh, thor the, thoroughly mixed together. The, uh, the beeswax is completely melted. At that point in time, you can, you can start stirring in the uh, diatomaceous earth uh, and mix it up. Go ahead and take the heat off. And you're going to keep stirring it, unlike the uh, mixture of the uh, sanding paste, where you could pour it hot into a container and let it and let it cool. In this case, you're going to have to keep stirring it up. All right, you can pour the uh, sanding butter while it's hot and melted, and into a container. But when it comes to the the sanding paste, it's an emulsion and it needs to stay in suspension. So you need to keep stirring it until it's it's just about dry into the pot and then scoop it out. Otherwise, if it's still melted when you're setting it, uh, when you pour it, you're going to have the heavier particles sink to the bottom. Not good. Okay, it's about 10 minutes later, and I'm still stirring it. It's you can tell it's getting thicker and thicker. Now, at what point in time I got to quit stirring? I don't know. It's getting. It, it is still cooling and it is going to get harder, but I suspect it's hard enough now where it's not likely to settle out. But I'm going to be patient and continue to the stirring process for. Do you feel that this doesn't affect uh, using finishes uh, as you said? I on have the other never. Product? 
I have never had a problem, and I've used, I mostly use uh, Minwax antique oil. Um, so I've never had any problem. Mineral oil, because it's uh, it's 50% mineral spirits and 50% uh, oil, it, it, it won't have any effect. And the key is you want to clean the surface. You want to keep rubbing on the surface until you don't get any stain on, on your, uh, your paper towel. And then there's, there's virtually n nothing on the surface. Now, some of it might be down in the pores, but again, because of the solvents used in virtually every finish, uh, they're compatible with a wax, and it, it's just not an issue. I've used lacquer, I've used mineral oil, I've used shellac, uh, I've used uh, polyurethane, Never had any problems with anything. One additional comment for those of us uh, that have pools in Southern California, most of our filters use DE in the pool filters. Yeah, good point. I'd forgotten about that. Uh, that is another source. Now you can get it online, but it tends to be very expensive. And they, they, when it's online, they'll say it's food, food grade. Now, <laughs> you know, it's ground up limestone, dirt. I, I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference which what kind you use. It'll all work. It'll all work fine. I've done a comparison with with U-Butte, butte Yorkshire grit and my homemade stuff. And frankly, I don't really see any any difference between any of them. I tried to actually use a microscope, as I recall, and could not discern any real differences between them. Except that the U-Butte Triple E, I wouldn't use that stuff anymore because it smells bad. Uh, this stuff smells very nice because of the beeswax. Uh, and, and it doesn't have the, the, the solvents in it like, like the uh, U-Butte Triple E. Um, now, if, I was, if it was just one person and you're not using this stuff all the time, it's probably cheaper just buy a can of uh, Yorkshire grit than it is to get all these supplies. Uh, but it's very cost effective if you have a club outing or, or gathering where you're going to do this as a as a, a, a group of folks. Then it becomes extremely cost effective. Like I, I say, maybe two to no more three than three dollars for an eight ounce container where uh, an eight ounce container of Yorkshire grit is going to cost you about thirty five dollars.